as I said last week, you know, we're looking at, you know, this week and next week we're looking at the history of computers, try and make it somewhat entertaining. And again, the reason we're doing this is so you can see the sort of mistakes people have made in the past so that you don't make them in the future. Um, I'd like to think that anyway, but I'm not holding my breath. Because I, you, this industry just goes cycles and you see the same mistakes being made over and over again. So, I mean, if we got to the, when we got to the early 70s, if you were talking about computers, we were talking about things like this. They either were mainframes that filled in our entire room, um, or they were mini computers that, you know, you could probably fit on a desk. So, you know, they weren't really intended for just everybody to use. And, you know, we were down, they were still very specialized pieces. <coughs> What I'm going to start doing is working through a timeline. Now you'll notice this timeline only goes up to 2009. That doesn't mean that it's stopped then. It just means that that's more like recent knowledge for you and we sort of discuss it more generally. But we're going to start way back in 1972. With this little bit. <laughs> Uh, the thing that made the personal computer possible was the introduction of the microprocessor. The idea of a, an entire computer on a chip. And it's interesting that, you know, the, the processors you use in PCs today, particularly the Intel or AMD ones, the Intel architecture, a lot of the design ideas can go way back to 1972 with the Intel 8008 processor. I mean, this was uh, Intel's first real processor. Now, there were, it's not, you know, we're focusing on Intel a lot here, but there were quite a few other processors kicking around at the same time. This wasn't just Intel. You know, Texas Instruments were coming out with microprocessors, uh, Motorola, uh, and a few other companies, as we'll see. But Intel is the one that's going to, you know, it was the one that really set the stage later. And it is interesting that if you look at the architecture of the, you know, your core i7s today, some of the ideas in that can be traced all the way back to these processes. But the, it was two years later with the Intel 880 that things really started to happen. Because you actually started seeing adverts for this idea of a personal computer. Now, and let's be clear, what we're talking about is quite expensive. A lot of them are kits. You know, you just didn't go to your, uh, shop, any old shop on, uh, and buy a computer. <coughs> uh, they were very much hobbies. But the idea was you could build a computer around <coughs> this processor. Now, I'm, I'm going to use terminology in this, some of you might know, in this lecture, but, and some of you might not. By the end of this year, you will be familiar with the, you know, the terminology, you know, we're talking about buses and that sort of thing. Those of you who do the introduction to computer science lecture will become very familiar with a lot of these terms. But the key thing was, the 8080 and the 16-bit, what that meant was it could act, address a uh, grand... You know, amount of memory could be addressed over 16 bits. We meant that it could hold address 64k of memory. That's it, 64k. And it had an 8-bit database, which meant it dealt with things one byte at a time. It also had a stack pointer, and we'll be talking about stacks in introduction to computer science, and. And a 60-bit program counter, which also meant that the programs couldn't live in that 64k memory. And we go up to, and it had 256 I/O ports. Uh, so I/O device. The old point of this was that you, know, you could connect into, uh, input or output devices, and the processor could communicate them without taking up any of the address space. Now, as a result of this process, a few things started to happen. 
First of all, this is really the first real processor, uh, microcomputer, the Alta 8800. Well, However, yeah, you want to say it. Now, there's some key things here. <coughs> the keyboard. You set the toggles on the front of the switch. There's no big, you know, it was just communicated by flashing lights. Uh, so you just entered your, you know, you entered the program in through machine code in the form of binary digits. Not really very sophisticated, to say the least. At the same time, MOS technology came out with a request called the 6502. And the key thing about this, it was cheaper than the Intel one. And so it actually started to get adopted by quite a few manufacturers. Again, it had very much the same, it's had the same address space as the uh, Intel processor, so 64K. <coughs> and yeah, yeah, it, it was architecturally a little, little bit different. But, and for, but for many years, these two processors were the mainstay of computers, 6502 and the 8080. And a little company called Microsoft made its appearance so this way back then. And its first, you know, what it started out by doing was the basic programming language. Now, basic back then was not visual, uh, what the visual basic you might be familiar with today, very much just textual. And then uh, <coughs> Microsoft, uh, the, these three guys who were the backbone of Microsoft, they were the people that started it produced a version of BASIC for the Alta, and it was produced on paper tape, so it was just fed into a paper tape reader, but later on it would be built into the ROMs on PC. So, you know, these early PCs, to be honest, to, to use them you had to be a programmer, really, because when you booted up the computer, it booted almost really into the programming language, and so Back then, you tend to, yeah, people, they were very much hobbyist machines. You know, you typed in programs and <coughs> see what happened. So, moving on to 1976, Apple. <coughs> Again, these, these companies that we are so familiar with as brand names now. You know, they started off as very small companies. Uh, and there were two Steve's. Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Steve Wozniak was the, the guy who designed the computer. His friend Steve Jobs had the idea of selling it. And uh, they, you know, they demonstrated it to a computer club. <coughs> In Palo Alto, in California, um, it's now right in this, which Palo Alto is right now in the middle of Silicon Valley, what is we now know today as Silicon Valley, uh, right next to Stanford University. And like I say, they built it uh, based on the 6502 processor, and simply because it was cheaper than the Intel one. Well, you know, if it had been for price, they would have probably gone with Intel from day one. And then the history could have been quite different. I bet it produced about 200 units. And again, it was a hobbyist computer. In fact, you could buy it as a kit. Um, so, if you, you know, but to, to make a working computer, you had to provide case, power supply, keyboard, display. So if you imagine the sort of a very, very simple version of what we now, you know, they use the Raspberry Pi today, well, that's what the Apple One was. And those of you who are used to uh, the, night, the, uh, the real flashy image of Apple today, well, oh, there's a picture of an Apple One at the time. Yeah, we have a home-built case, and uh, not exactly what you'd think of as Apple, although I suspect those, those sell now for a lot of money. And the Apple One goes on the market now. Those original ones, they sell for a lot. <coughs> so, 
the thing I was starting to pick up a little bit. Now, what I'm really focusing on now is the U.S. What was happening in the U.S. marketplace? They were leading the charge, but these machines were showing up in the U.K. as well. But we'll talk about the U.K. industry. So, 1977, there were three things that happened when that kind of defined that idea. First of all, the Commodore PET. Now, again, this was based on the 6582. Um, it had a chiplet, it was like, you know, a calculator type keyboard, although it actually did have a full-size keyboard. Interestingly, the note, the, uh, this is the way you loaded and uh, saved programs at the time, cassette deck. You didn't have floppy, uh, right, these other computers didn't have things like disks, that sort of thing. <coughs> Where, you know, if you bought, you know, there was a starting to appear a little bit of an obvious market for packaged software but you would buy it on a cassette, and you load it in, uh, and you know, you'd hear the god awful noise of bits being, you know, screeching noise of bits being played into the computer. It was a yeah, cassette thing. And you know, if you wrote your own programs, that's how you saved them. So, as you can imagine, loading and saving programs was quite slow. The Commodore Pet was, Probably the first successful main, you know, computer sold in a large number. And it kicked around for quite a long time. Oops, sorry, I went to click to the link where I got that. There you go. <coughs> the other thing that appeared there was the Apple II. Now, unlike the Apple I, which was sold as a circuit board, you had your own book. Uh, you had your own case and things like that. The Apple II was sold as a complete computer. Now, you'll notice this has got disk drives and everything, but the actual Apple II computer really was this white case down here. You know, again, by default, you loaded into, uh, you know, loaded the safe programs on cassette tape. Uh, by default, the Apple II tended to sell with about 48K of RAM. <coughs> But it was a much nicer looking machine, and you could buy it, and again, be able to start using it. Not much of the way software to buy it, you know, still it was, you know, people buying, getting, typing in programs, and doing the programming themselves. However, in 1979, probably, you know, you want to talk about software, it kicked off an industry. Two guys by the name of Dan Bricklin and Bob Brentwood wrote in a press, the very first spreadsheet package. Now again, we're so used to using things like Excel today. But prior to this, the idea of spreadsheets didn't exist. And it's what really, you know, sold the Apple II. For, you know, all of a sudden, businesses started seeing a real use for these personal computers. Because the idea of it was a spreadsheet package. <coughs> and it really did start you know, driving the sale of uh, Apple IIs. At the same time, floppy disk, floppy disk drives were starting to appear. And again, you know, we're so used to thinking of disk drive capacities in the gigabytes now. Well, back then, you know, if you got you know, you tend to start, you initially started out with 18 floppy disk drives, went down to five and a quarter inch. You were lucky if you got 100K on a disk. So, again, capacity is sort of very small. Now, those, so those were the two mainstream 6502 computers. It was the PET from Commodore and the Apple II. Now, of course, there were other ones kicking around, but you have smaller manufacturers. What was happening on the Intel chip? We haven't kind of said much about the Intel chip, other than that it appeared. There was quite a few manufacturers starting to produce computers based on the Intel chip. And they just tended to be more business oriented. And what made those really uh, popular was this thing called CPM. It was really the first, you know, kind of separate operating system where you had one oper an operating system that can run on many different types of computer. 
uh, uh, originally written by Gary Kiddle and did soil research. And it was for Intel uh, 8080 based machines and the Xilog Z80 machines. Z uh, the Z80 was uh, based on the 8080 but with a few extra instructions. And so, you know, if you, you could buy uh, these personal computers based on the Intel chip, you can get CPM to run on it. And it was a disk off EO, it ran on a floppy disk drive. And so it was, you know, things were starting to really take off. And it became one of the sort of real first industry standards. If you're buying a business computer, then could it run CPM can be important. Because you started to see packages, you know, software packages being produced for CPM. Not so much for particular hardware. But to for a CPM based machine. You know, prior to this, you know, you, you bought packages for the Apple II or the PET. And they had to they were different, you know, the, those packages had to be written separately for those machines. Now you have an operating system in the form of CPM. And you could target that. Now when I say operating system, it's nothing like what we're used to seeing today. Very uh, <coughs> simple, uh, limited functionality. You know, this, if you were right, if you targeting CPM itself, then you you could write to you know output the screen and read back from read from the keyboard. There was no fancy windowing. It was t essentially you were treating the screen just like a teletype. <coughs> but it, you really you know we had this operating system that, that manufacturers could target. And so it gave increased the market size for you know, these, these uh, companies that want to produce software. So here's the sort of minimal requirements. As you see, very simple uh, ASCII uh, uh, output. And forget graphics and blah. And you had to have only 16K of <coughs> Uh, you yeah, can go to 64K, given that this was running on uh, you know, the Intel 1880. And at least one floppy disk drive. Yeah, it was quite, got quite interesting on those days if you only had one floppy disk drive because you would boot the operating system <coughs> and then take the disk out, put your application package in, run that, and then you want to save some data, so you put another disk in, you know, get one disk You were forever shoveling disks around on that disk drive. in the US, and those machines were appearing around here. Yeah, I, mean, I remember playing with an uh, Apple II and uh, also a Commodore Pet. Of course, there were other machines around, the Tandy TRS-80, um, and all of those machines all appeared around this time. In England, you know, really, you know, there were some companies producing business machines based on CPM. But the hobby, you know, no one had really targeted the home obvious market. The first one that did really was Sinclair with the ZX80. I mean, what was important there is, first of all, it sold for under $200 in American money, you know, over, over, just over £100 here. Um, let's see. It did have a few limitations, though. No sound support, no colour support. You could only deal with whole numbers. Yeah, forget any numbers with decimal points. Uh, yeah, the key keyboard was a membrane flap. It was like almost touching like, like touch on a <coughs> touch screen today. And uh, very slow. Oh, and the amount of memory that came with it was one K. <coughs> followed one year later, it followed by a much more powerful machine, the ZX81. So there's the ZX80 up there, and you can see it was a Probably about that size. Yeah. Um, ZX81 was a much better looking machine, slightly better keyboard, not much. Still came with 1K of RAM on it. You could buy an add on, that big brick sitting on the back, that gave you 16K of RAM. 
and it was notorious for falling off. You know, you have to be really careful if you move the machine around because the ram would fall off and then you, you're screwed. So, you know, you're putting it back, but of course, whatever program you'd been busily typing in was lost. And, uh, again, still saving paper, uh, cassette. There were no disk drives for these, for the Sinclair machines. What happened in the UK was around about this time, though, in 1981, was interesting. The BBC got involved. <coughs> they had been thinking about doing a computer literacy project. <coughs> um, and they wanted to do a series of computer, uh, programs. But, of course, you know the BBC is non-commercial. And they want, so they wanted to have standardised on one computer but they didn't want to show any favouritism towards any existing manufacturers, because that it was a bit dodgy under the BBC's charter. So they decided to do their own. Uh, so they contracted with Acorn um, to build the BBC Micro. There was two versions of it, the Model A and the Model B. It's the first computer I owned, actually. The, I, in my final year at university, I bought myself a computer. Uh, Still around about 400 pounds. Um, I came with 32k RAM. But it was actually quite an advanced machine for its time. Because it, oh, it had a lot of uh, expansion ports underneath. You could plug in not just disk drives, but extra processors. You could buy add on processors that communicated through a proprietary bus that they called the tube. Um, so it was a really nice machine. It had good, uh, quite good graphics on the on the screen. So, yeah, nice machine. And it became, of course, became very big in the UK, particularly in school. You know, for many years you go into the schools. There's the TV app. So IBM decided they wanted to get in to the PC market. And they did something very unusual for them. They actually used off the shelf components. They 
put a secret group together down in Florida. And they came up with this design. And it was built around the Intel 8088 processor, uh, off-the-shelf components. And they, you know, this was all done, total secrecy, which would be difficult to do today, right? <coughs> well, the good thing was, it was quite a dull ball. But it was from IBM. And so, and it was built like a tank. I mean, it was so solid. And that took, you know, steel case. And so all these other computers like the Apple II look like toys by comparison. Now, you have to realize still, when we're talking about an IBM PC, the base, rate, the base of the range there still only has 16K of RAM. Still could load data off a cassette recorder, although most of them came with at least one floppy disk drive. <coughs> but it is interesting, given the fact that IBM, you know, you think so serious, and you know, we are the you know, big boy of the computer industry. So who did they choose for their advertising? If you're thinking of buying a personal computer, and all the signs say it's to take the first step, a few questions may still be holding back. Will your PC have the power you want to run the software you want? So, uh, but the IBM ads went on for many, uh, uh, using Charlie Chaplin went on for many years. So, they built the PC using off the shelf components, you know, okay, your standard processors from Intel, standard type of memory chips. <coughs> they did also something else that was very new for IBM. They went outside for the operating system as well. And they went looking for companies. Now, <coughs> the, the whole story of how IBM chose the operating system is mine and me. Um, you know, because at that time, remember, that, you know, on business computers, on the, the business personal computers, the big, the big one of uh, all was CPM. Yeah. That you know, and now that was still running all the old 8-bit computers. Now, the PC was a 16-bit computer, the uh, uh, ET88 and/or uh, uh, data in 16-bit chunks. And it could act, actually address one uh, megabyte of memory, although a lot of that was actually addressed, reserved for system routines and video memory. So in actual fact, so you ended up with 640K of RAM. So those machines at that time, although you, you know, the chip could actually address one megabyte in the address space, you could be restricted to 640k of RAM. But for an operating system, originally IBM did talk to digital research. And I say, you know, you, go, you, know, you should go out and find out, you know, exactly what happened at that meeting is still, there's some myth there. But for whatever reason, IBM did not choose to go to CPA, even though there was a 16-bit version available. <coughs> so, Bill Gates, never <coughs> being someone who lets a good business still get away from him. Uh, he did know of a operating system that somebody else was in around Seattle had written. And uh, he bought, purchased all the rights to it. And sold it. <coughs> the rights that to IBM. But he was the key, and so IBM would sell that operating system under the name of CDOS. He was the crafty bit. He didn't give IBM exclusive rights. 
So IBM didn't have, you know, weren't the only company that could use that operating system. So Microsoft were free to sell that to other manufacturers of MS-DOS, which becomes quite important. So before I start talking about sort of software industry, you know, it is kind of interesting to look back. Remember, an IBM PC, about this time, if you were, you know, top end of an, you know, range of an IBM PC, you had, if you were lucky, 640K of RAM, most had uh, probably 128 or 256K. It had two floppy disk drives, so you booted the operating system. So to boot the machine, you put the operating system in the first disk drive, and you flip the on-off switch. Uh, I found this video a couple of years ago, and I thought it was kind of interesting because it shows what it was like to use an early IBM PC. In particular, just when you think, when you're swearing at how long your machine takes to boot today. Look at this. Oh yeah, that was the sound from it. <clears throat> Turn the on, this machine's been turned on, and it's now starting to boot. software companies got used to doing sh the function keys with shift and alt combinations and it was really nice because you could just do it with one hand <coughs> and when the IBM changed the keyboard layout to have the function keys across the top it became a bit of pain actually. So in a lot of the, you know if you look at the keyboard layouts of the, some of those early applications they look it would seem a bit odd now. There you go it's just booted. Well starting. The first thing it always ever did was ask you what today's date is. Never remembered it. <clears throat> Change out of about five thousand dollars. Let's 
Christ is. That's what Christ is looking at. We'll get to the Unfortunately, I have, by the way, skipped past the forward agreement. Oh, yes, now we'll go to the uh, color graphics as well. Now, you're going to see, um, it looks like the display is shimmering or moving up. That's just because you're recording a CRT from a video camera and it's not the same. Uh, but the display was actually quite a fairly steady. access to the disk drive, uh, accessing the screen, the key, the keyboard. It was just a relatively small piece of code, but it was proprietary. And so, you know, if you wanted to, you know, come out with a clone of the IBM PC, you had to do, essentially build your own, create your own BIOS. And so, but that is what some companies did. And there were a couple of uh, companies that did this and came out with what we call clean room versions of the uh, BIOS from the IBM PC. They did all the functionality, but they did it without actually looking at the code that ran on the IBM's BIOS. And the first one was compact. But they didn't come out with a desktop computer to start with. What they came out with was a portable. Now, portable <coughs> is um, an interesting term. It was a big thing. Um, yes, uh, that way. Okay, I I was working for a company down in Newbury, Berkshire, and I was coming to visit my parents who lived in near here for the weekend. And I actually had a deadline, so I had to bring a computer home with me. I carried one of those buggers <laughs> on a train from Newbury up to London, across London on the underground, and up, and then put it back on the train, and come up to small uh, up to Derby, and God, you had to look after it because. It, you know, you, think you can imagine this is a, uh, a case with a, it was a five and a quarter inch CRT screen in there. Uh, now this had two floppies. The machine I had but then was actually a clone of the IBM XT, which we'll mention in a moment, which actually had hard drive. Oh. Portable is a, a bit of an odd term. Loggable, I think, is the word I would use. But the key thing was it was the first 100% compatible IBM PC clone. Pretty much any, any software you bought would run on the, that would run on the IBM PC would run on this. And as you can imagine, lawsuits happened and everything. But eventually, the, the BIOS manufacturers persevered and uh, won out. 
But with, this was the start of the clone industry, the clones of the original IBM PC. And uh, that was out of the bag. That's, you know, we're going to now, IBM at that point had really started losing the battle because these companies were coming, the clone manufacturers were usually coming out either faster than IBM with new <coughs> functionality, as we'll see in a moment, or they uh, added more into the machines. But the next big advance was the IBM PC XT hard drive, 10 megabytes. Now, again, you think about 10 meg, that's a nice chunk change now. I mean, you, know, you just can't imagine. But that was a big advantage. That was actually, this is actually the first version of the IBM PC I used. And I was like, wow, oh, hard drive. Oh. <coughs> it, was, you know, it was an amazing a speed improvement. And then, in 1984, which are a date that will become famous for other things, the IBM 18. Now, first of all, you know, it was a bigger hard drive, but more importantly, it was a new Intel processor, the 286. <coughs> um, if you remember the Intel 88, and the 8086, which was, you know, they were restricted to one megabyte of RAM. Or one megabyte of address space. And that included all the ROM and everything. So really restricted to 640K of RAM. And there started to be some really interesting tricks coming in that to, okay, if the machine had more than this, could we you know, be swapped in and out? And, <coughs> But the 8286 was the first processor that actually could address more than the one megabyte RAM. It actually could address up to 16 meg. The problem was the operating system was DOS, and it could not. It assumed you were running on an 8086 or an 8088, and now you could not address more than one meg, uh, one meg of RAM. And so what happened is uh, quite a few other companies started to get creative on this, um, producing what was known as DOS extenders. I mean, the company I worked for did, because we were dealing with companies that wanted to access more than one, uh, yeah, more than 640K around. But they were all different. They all went into dodgy tricks to do it. Um, there was no consistency. So although the machine could, do, you know, the hardware could address more than one meg, Still, most software was restricted to the 640K of RAM. And the, you know, so what we're seeing now is the hardware, how stripping the software. And this got even worse in 1986 when the Compact came out with the uh, Despro 386, which was an Intel 386 processor. So this was the first 32-bit processor. Um, you know, it's the sort of granddaddy of the processors we still use today, really. And, but the software could not, in most cases, access that RAM. So even though these machines could access a lot more RAM, most of the software was still restricted. So, what we need to, you know, we're at this point with the hardware where, you know, it's really outstripped what software can do. You know, if you're running these machines, you're still running DOS in most cases. There was a version of uh, Unix kicking around, Zen, but it wasn't you know, used a lot. So, the other thing is, is the user interface. Character-based. It was still all character-based. Even though now we had video cards that were capable of doing, you know, some reasonably nice graphics, the software just wasn't. If you wanted to use that, you had to write specifically for that card, that graphics card. 
So any games around this time, they were written specifically for a particular graphics card. And so, or, or for a range of graphics, a particular range of graphics cards. And, um, so if you did have that graphics card, you were screwed. Same with sound cards. There were different sound card manufacturers. Um, you get, you know, and it was amazing how many times you got one of these games and you had to mess about with the settings of your machine to get the thing to work. It was, you know, so different to how we're so used to doing it today. So, just go show you this bit and then we'll, it's got to lead in, you know, and then we'll adjourn until the next one. Let's get back. We remember we're working in the early 80s now. But we still were digging character based machines. But there was no reason for it to be that way. It's way back in 1968. A group of people working at the Xerox um, Park Center in, again, back in near Stanford University in Menlo Park, California, did a demonstration of an online system they've been working on. Notice that online system, which was a game of something that didn't, you know, internet that didn't exist. So this was attended by a thousand computer professionals. Now you can go online and find the entire, a, book, you know, a recording of the entire presentation. But what I've done is just taken a clip from it. Um, but it, just go back, it, what was, What's so great about this is it showed things that I've just never been seen before, including the mouse, um, bitmap displays, and a lot of other things that really we just take for granted. Collaboration between users. This was all demonstrated in 1968. And look how long it took for some of those ideas to become mainstream. But it's all stuff we take for granted today. Okay, to talk about control devices, we'll use this overhead camera shot. When you can see the devices, so I just read. We have a keyboard there, but there's a mouse. Yeah, we're pointing the mouse call the mouse. And then we also have standard keyboard and special keys that we have. Yeah, the cord idea that we're going to go for a picture down our laboratory in Menlo Park and type it up. It'll show you another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, then we'll park. Okay, there's Tom Andrews' hand, then we'll park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working. And the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with the movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. Right? It moves up or down or sideways, so it's a tracking spot. And the, the principle for its operation is that you can see. You cannot imagine how radical this idea was. Can you hear me, Don? We can turn it over and we'll see, right? It's principle is that there are two wheels that grow on the surface. The principle at right angles have kind of sharp edges. One roll, the other slide in one direction. Each of, the, each of these wheels controls the potentiometer of the voltage output. Simple by an AD converter. The numbers taken in by a computer at sample times is to what the horizontal vertical components are to be of where it should put the tracking spot. And as the mouse moves over a surface, then each of those wheels either slides sideways without rolling or rolls, and a mouse will very closely duplicate the particular component of horizontal vertical and the net motion it makes. I'm going to move on, but it's really worthwhile just doing a search on this guy's name. And, you know, you can look at the videos of this presentation, see how so far ahead of what was, you know, used in the computer industry at that time. We were talking 68. <coughs> uh, it was just amazing. But those ideas didn't actually get really adopted until 
by the people at Xerox. Now, you know, most people have heard of Xerox, but they've been known for photocopiers. But they did also desktop publishing, uh, and they, they came out with the Xerox Alter that used a lot of these ideas. It really wasn't a commercial product, but it was used in you know, park and, other, and universities as a research tool. And that's what it looked like. I need to stop clicking on things. So, but we scoot forward eight years, and a commercial product came out, the Zero Star. And that was used by a lot of companies to do desktop publishing. Well, it didn't exactly cheap, though. $17,000. So, but the key one is this is probably the first commercial product that had all these things we take for granted. You know, Windows Base, graphics, you know, icon, folders, maps, these networks. So it wasn't just the GUI, it was the whole idea of collaborative working. And the Xerox Star actually stayed around for quite a long time as a a desktop publishing system. If you were doing documentation, you know, again, you can't get a word for it. I actually had a star. I actually had a few stars kicking around here. You know, it was how they produced all the documentation. <coughs> That's when software used to have documentation. Mm -hmm. You actually sold software with manuals. And I just don't know, just to show where. Now, Apple has gone through a we were going through an interesting time. When did they have the Apple II? That was followed by the Apple III. That really wasn't that different and never re was nothing like the runaway success of the Apple II. And then we're looking at ideas about where to go next. And the Apple Lisa came out in 1983. And it was the first attempt by of Apple with to do a completely different user interface. Um, the problem with the, the Lisa was, A, it was bloody expensive, $10,000. But more importantly, it was very underpowered. <coughs> it used a Motorola 68000 processor, which <coughs> just really wasn't up. The speed of it wasn't up to the requirements. The, Used, so it wasn't a big seller, but those ideas went on to be, <laughs> to be adopted in follow on, which was, of course, the Mac. And we'll look at that next week, and then what, what was happening in the other side of the industry <laughs> at that point. So we'll follow on so this part of what happened with the Mac and everything in the next week. <laughs>